Thank you all very much for coming. It's great to see so many of you. I'm Hannah McInnes. I'm thrilled to welcome you here on behalf of the How To Academy. You might notice there are quite a few of you. It's been so popular, this event, they had to have another additional event just to avoid disappointment. Um, it's hardly surprising, given, of course, the compelling subject matter of leadership and also our guest this evening, one of the most, most expert men in the field of leadership. It really is such an honour to have him here with us. General Stanley McChrystal, a man who Robert Gates, the Defence Secretary for Barack Obama and for George Bush, called one of the most in incredible warriors and leaders of men that I've ever met. Um, he served in the US Army for 34 years, retiring in 2010 as a four-star Army general, perhaps best known for commanding JSOC, uh, the American Joint Special Operation Command, and forces, NATO forces in Afghanistan. Um, now he's a fellow at Yale University, where he teaches international relations, and the head of the McChrystal Group, which is consulting businesses. Um, this is, I think, your third book, or his other books have been yeah. New York Times bestsellers, and this latest book, Leaders, Myth and Reality, that we will base our discussion on this evening, really is a compelling an illuminating piece of work. Um, if you haven't read it, I highly suggest you do, and I'm sure you have your copies, which General McChrystal will be signing afterwards um, this evening. But don't expect to read it or to go away with a sort of precise 10-point plan and an idea of how to make a perfect leader. It's about exploring leadership uh, in all its complexities. Um, it says in big, bold letters on the back, leadership is not what you think it is, and it never was. Um, of course, every day would probably be a very opportune moment, or leadership is a hot topic on any given evening, but particularly this evening, um, a day when America has woken up to the results of its midterm elections, which will determine how power uh, is balanced in the country for the next few years, um, and of course, an election that was focused around their somewhat controversial leader, who I think uh, is still halfway through a press conference, which seems to be quite, a, quite a, an eventful press conference in which some of the CNN reporters were refusing to sit down when, I, when we last came in. So hopefully we'll be able to talk a little bit um, about that as well um, and about the general's experiences as a leader himself this evening. Uh, I will be talking to him for around 45 minutes, uh, a little bit longer, and then there'll be a chance for you all to ask questions. So uh, please raise your hands high. There'll be roving mics. Don't go away wishing you'd ask something in this rather special opportunity to do so. So if you'll all join me again in giving a warm and welcome to General Stanley McChrystal. Right. Thank, you. Thank you, a very warm welcome. Um, could you just start off by telling us what your aim was in, in writing this book, what you wanted your reader to take away from it? Absolutely. Let me first by thank you for having me, Hannah, and thank everybody for coming here tonight. When I look at the crowd, I'm guessing that there may be a few people I got to serve with in Afghanistan and Iraq, and I particularly thank you guys for what you did and, and for being here tonight. Um, this book was not the end, but it was a part of a journey of me trying to figure out leadership. What had happened is I had spent a lifetime trying to be a leader. I'd been taught leadership. I'd learned some. I'd practiced some. I'd made uh, some mistakes. I've had some successes. Then when I left the military, I wrote my memoirs. And when I wrote my memoirs, I thought I'd sort of figured out leadership, and I would just write this triumphal book about how great it was. <laughs> and uh, I had this really interesting experience in that as I started to write the memoirs, I wanted to get the full story, so I had a young person working with me, and we did a whole bunch of interviews with people who'd been there. And so I'd made a decision, and then there'd been an outcome, good or bad, for which I'd gotten credit or blame. But as we did the interviews, what we found was my memory was not wrong, but in almost every case, it was stunningly incomplete. What it meant was I'd have given an order and I thought something that happened. Actually, a whole bunch of other people did a whole bunch of other things that I never knew about. And there were other factors playing on it and then something would happen. And what it did is it put my role in context where I mattered, but I wasn't the star of the show. And I, I wasn't as important as I thought I was. And that sort of calibrated me on, well, wait a minute. If I wasn't the fulcrum of history in that case, maybe... I don't actually understand leadership as much as I think I do. And then we went on and wrote another book, Team of Teams, about how teams work together. 
And the same thing, we, we took an experience we'd had, particularly in Iraq in, in transforming Joint Special Operations Command and how people operate, and we'd studied other businesses to see whether our experience had been unique to, to war or to special operations. We found out, no, it hadn't. It was exactly what was hitting everybody. It's a context change of the environment now, faster, more, uh, more complex that they have to navigate. And so as we went to write the next book, we really sat down there and said, well, we, we actually don't understand leadership. Now, at age 64, when I've been a leader and I've been teaching leadership now for nine years at Yale, it's kind of embarrassing to admit I don't understand leadership. I don't even know what it is. And there's a standard definition of leadership, which is sort of accepted. It's the ability to influence people to do things. But we didn't think that was right. So we went back to Plutarch, first century historian, and we started studying leadership. And we came exactly to the conclusion Hannah mentioned. We don't understand leadership because it's not what we think it is, and it never has been. So we've been essentially confused about it, not just me, but most of us for our whole lives with some pretty big implications to that. So we decided to write a book, not that we would be able to absolutely put a nail in what leadership is, but we would extend the conversation, the exploration to identify the challenge and start people moving in the direction of that. And frankly, with what's going on in my country right now, the other goal which really came up partway through the book was to start a national conversation on leadership start a conversation not down in the tactics or politics, but at a higher level. The sort of what do we want to be as a society? What's our role as followers? And what do we want for our leaders? And if we can get that conversation started, we think the book will be a success. I want to come on to that a little bit later, perhaps yes, um, your country. But let's um, look a little bit more at, at how you, the layout of the book and the, and the structure. So you've chosen 13 extraordinary characters, some who we know lots about, others I'm ashamed to say that I didn't. Um, how did you come about choosing them and why did you decide on, on this structure? Absolutely, because Plutarch had it. And so what I had never read Plutarch. I knew who he was by name. He's a first century historian. He kind of invented biography. And he wrote lives or parallel lives of the Greeks and Romans as it's sometimes known, 48 uh, leaders with a Greek and Roman in each case, or in most cases, uh, compared to each other at the end. And he was really searching for virtue. He was trying to give us people we could emulate or have cautionary tales of. So if it was good enough for Plutarch, it was good enough for us. So we decided to do, we couldn't do 48, so we decided to do six pairs of leaders or 12 leaders. And we wanted diversity, so we, we wanted gender diversity, race diversity, nationality, field of endeavor diversity, good and bad diversity. So we went out and we, we started picking and we ended up with geniuses, Albert Einstein and Leonard Bernstein, founders, Walt Disney and Coco Chanel. And I'll tell you right now, I didn't know she was a person until we started this book. I thought it was just a sign in the mall when you see Chanel. We had heroes, Harriet Tubman, the slave, and Zhang Ha, a 14th century Chinese admiral. We had zealots, Maximilian Robespierre, the French Revolution, and Abu Musab al-Zarqawi of more recent times. We had reformers, Martin Luther of the Protestant Reformation, and uh, Martin Luther King Jr. of the American Civil Rights Movement. And then finally, we had power brokers. We started with politicians, but we really thought it was better to have power brokers, and we had Boss Tweed, a corrupt New York politician of the 19th century, and paired him against Margaret Thatcher, the famous prime minister of Great Britain. And so the idea was to give a wide range, not identifying what's alike in them, but really addressing the question, why did they emerge as leaders? And then what was the impact of that? The first leader that you talk about, Robert E. Lee, um, he isn't paired up with anyone. No. And uh, there seems to be a lot of significance in this character for you, yeah. someone you thought was a great leader at the start of your career um, and a, a man whose reputation has been questioned a lot in recent years. Um, tell us a little bit about his, his position in the book and, and, and in your life. Sure. We, we couldn't write a book about leaders and leadership that I put my name on that didn't include Robert E. Lee. 
And the reason is not because I think he's the greatest leader, but for my life, he was the biggest example of positive leadership that I tried to emulate. And to sort of put it in context, he grew up not far from where I did. He grew up in Alexandria, Virginia. He was of the famous Lee family of Virginia. He was a descendant of, not by blood, of George Washington, who lived only 10 miles away. He had gone through a life that turned out to be quite similar to mine. He went went to West Point as a young man, then went to 32 years in the United States Army. I had grown up in the same area. I had gone to Washington Lee High School. Although a century later, I followed him to West Point. When I got there, he was a figure to emulate. There were other generals with statues and whatnot, but I lived in Lee Barracks. There were paintings of Robert E. Lee. And other people were people you could try to be like. Lee, you couldn't because he was too good. But you could try to use him as a beacon to move in that direction. He went through West Point with zero demerits. I did not do that. <laughs> but, but for a lifetime, I had thought about him as the penultimate description of leadership. When I was a second lieutenant, I got married to a young army brat. I've now been married to her for 41 years. Yeah, she gave me a painting of Robert E. Lee, and it wasn't a real painting. She paid 25 bucks for it. It was a, a cheap print, and somebody had painted over it with clear acrylic to give it brush strokes so it looked like a painting. Framed, it was $25, but on second lieutenant pay, that was a lot of money then. And so I had it with, with great pride for 40 years, and I hung it in every set of quarters where we lived. And it was for me two things. One, I'd look at it, and I'd think, well, that's who I want to be like. And when people came to my house, I was proud. They'd look at it and they'd go, that's who he wants to be like. Then in the spring of 2017, we had the activities at Charlottesville in in which white supremacists arguing over the removal of a statue of General Robert E. Lee incited violence and a person, in fact, was killed. And it really got a lot of focus in the U.S., And my wife, Annie, came to me and she says, I think you ought to take down the picture. And I said, wait a minute, I can't. You gave it to me. Anything you give me is sacred. She goes, yeah, I got it. (laughs) Take take down the picture. And I said, no, he's just a general. He's not a political person. He just did what he thought was right and he fought. And I want to be like him. And she said, well, when people come into our house, I think it may communicate something to them unintentionally. They may think you are trying to communicate that you agree with white supremacists. And I said, you know, I don't. She says, I do. They don't. I think you ought to get rid of the picture. So I took about a month arguing with her, holding my ground for a while. And then finally, I realized she was right. And on a Sunday morning in early summer of 2017, I took it down, took it out to the garbage and threw it away. Got picked up the next day by the garbage truck with the landfill. And it was an emotional thing for me because my connection to him had been emotional, visceral. And I started studying him more because we were just starting this book. And I said, well, you know, I can't be honest about studying leaders unless I include Robert E. Lee. But we've got to include him in a way that is thoughtful because he was very controversial in the U.S. Big argument about all the statues around the country that existed about him. So we started researching. I'd read a lot about him. I'd lived sort of in his shadow. But as we read more and we thought more deeply and we had hours of conversation, to include Jay Mangone, who is one of my co-authors, who's out in the audience here. What we really came to is here's a guy who had all the leadership traits and behaviors that we would admire. He was a courtly general. He was a decisive soldier. He was handsome. He was well-read. It was just all of these things. He wrote about duty. He wrote about honesty. But in the spring of 1861, after 32 years in the United States Army, he makes the decision, after being offered command of Northern or United States Army troops, he makes a decision instead to ally with his state, Virginia. And when Virginia secedes from the Union and joins the Confederacy, he goes with them. On the surface, that looks like loyalty to your state. But what he did was he violated his oath the same oath I'd taken to the United States, and he fought for the next four years to destroy the United States that his role model, George Washington, had done much to create. 
And he did it to protect slavery. That's what the Civil War was about. The greatest evil in American history. Now, so what's my conclusion? Do I come out that Robert E. Lee's evil and that I should never speak his name again? No, I don't come out that way. What I come out is Robert E. Lee was a good man, but he was a man. He was a human. He wasn't a two-dimensional picture or a statue or a myth. He was a person that made mistakes. In fact, he made what we call, at his Plutarchian moment, he made an incredibly big mistake. He forgot who he was. And he's fought, just like I am. And so it seemed appropriate to not pair him with anyone because his story was, to me, unique and very important, but also a great stepping stone to just how complex leadership actually is. So tell us about that. I mean, obviously, it's a lot to talk to fit in, but your three myths, sure. the, the things that we think we know about leadership, but really we don't. Uh, perhaps you could tell us about those three Sure, as we, as we started looking at leadership, we said, well, why don't we understand it? And then we came to the reality that we look at it through mythological eyes. When I was a child, my, my mother, was she loved mythology and Greek and Roman heroes, so she had books around and she'd give them to me to read. And there was a child's book that was my favorite. It was an orange book printed in 1929 in Chattanooga, Tennessee. And my mother had read it when she was a child. When I was a child... She read it to me, and one of the ones, and there was Theseus and Perseus and all, but one of the ones I remember very well was Atlas. And they'd have a very short narrative about the person. Then they'd have a hand-drawn picture. And the picture of Atlas is a pretty muscular guy in sort of a G-string, standing on top of a mountain, holding the sky on his shoulders. And you look at that thing and you go, that's ridiculous. But then you realize for many centuries, People used mythology to explain the unexplainable. People didn't know why the sky stayed where it was. Why didn't it fall? There had to be a reason. And so they came up with the idea that if it didn't fall, somebody must be holding it up, and it's Atlas. And there he is, and people accepted it. And so when we start to talk about myths, it's amazing how we accept myths, and we just kind of live with them. And so the three myths that we boiled it down to for the book the first was the formulaic myth about leadership. And that is, if you have the right traits or you exhibit the right behaviors, if you read the seven habits of highly effective people and you follow all of those, you're going to be a successful leader. Now, you'll learn some good things, but the reality is that doesn't correlate to, to factual outcome. When you actually study the performance of leaders, you find many, many leaders who have all of these traits in spades and they fail completely. Robert E. Lee not only made a bad mistake in the Civil War, he also lost. He lost, at the end of the day, to Ulysses S. Grant, who had very few of those traits, but he won. And we see that in business and other. So the reality is you can't simplify leadership down to a checklist. There's not a formula for it. The second we call the attribution myth, and that is the idea that the leader is the person that decides the outcome for the organization. If the organization fails or succeeds, the leader is the reason and therefore deserves credit or blame. In the military, we used to say a unit, a commander is responsible for all the unit does or fails to do. That's true, responsible in the command sense, not responsible in that they are the fulcrum of what happens. As you heard about my memoirs, when, we, when I studied my own life, I found I wasn't even the fulcrum in the actions there. And we look time and again at organizations where we look at those and we want to believe, we want to simplify it down to that outcome. And then the last myth is we call the results myth. And that's the idea that we are demanding results-oriented followers. We make our leaders produce. We want the CEO to make money. We want the president to win elections. We want the general to win battles. But in reality, that's not borne by experience either. We actually follow leaders that are serial failures often. We have emotional attachment to leaders more than we do on their actual outcome. And so we often follow people who take us to very negative places, but we elect, select, follow, support, whatever's appropriate in that thing, time and again. Because leadership is not a thing the leader does. Leadership 
is an interaction between followers, leaders, and these other contextual factors. It's like an emergent property from a chemical reaction almost. And so what it is is this thing that occurs, and, but we look at it almost two-dimensionally. In your selection, you have, as you've mentioned, three women, um, but you, you've written gender imbalance in leadership is both disturbing and unhealthy. What do you mean by that, and how can we overcome that? We, we wanted to write about as many women in the book as was appropriate, and yet when we looked to find leaders in history, because all of the people we profiled we decided would be dead, there were fewer opportunities for females to lead. And so there, there's less track record. There are people, we looked at Joan of Arc, we looked at uh, Catherine Graham of the Washington Post, we looked at a number. We settled on Margaret Thatcher, Coco Chanel, and Harriet Tubman. Each of their stories, if we look at it, is sort of an improbable rise to the success they did. Coco Chanel was an orphan. She learned to sew, she became a nightclub singer. She became a courtesan for some wealthy cavalry officer. Then, she, but she was very talented. She became an opportunistic business person. She saw that there was an intersection of factors right about the time of the First World War, heavy women's fashions that were expensive and very painful to wear. And she said, women are entering the workforce. Materials are more expensive. We want more freedom. Let's change that. And so she changed women's fashion to things lighter, more form-fitted, and then she lived the brand. She became the brand by dressing and acting, and she, she allured you saying, you want to be like Coco Chanel? I have a great life. Here's the clothes to wear. Here's the perfume to use, and then she created an empire, and she worked hard until the day of her death, and she was hard to work for, but extraordinary rise. Harriet Tubman was a five-foot-tall slave who escapes. And then she goes back into slave-controlled territory 13 times before the Civil War to lead to safety of other slaves. On any single occasion had she been captured, she would have probably been killed or at least put back into slavery, sold to the Deep South. She had no formal education, no position, no election appointment, and yet she becomes this spiritual symbol for females, for slaves, for abolitionists, for people trying to, to give a better life. And she becomes a leader unintentionally, but a powerful leader through her example and her courage. And then there's Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher, you know, the grocer's daughter. She grows up in a time in politics when it's not simple for a female to move to the top in politics. In fact, she got heckled in her early days in parliament, made fun of for the female traits of her. She took voice lessons from Laurence Olivier to lower her voice to sound more like a political leader. And yet, she became a woman of conviction. She took her way. She worked her way to the top. There were no free breaks. And then she became, of course, one of the most famous prime ministers in British history. All of those characters have faults, but in reality, they're amazing success stories probably harder road than any man did. It still hasn't gotten that much better. One of the things we, we found as we did research that you probably won't be surprised that there are more male CEOs now in the United States than there are female CEOs. What is disturbing is there are more male CEOs named John than there are all, all female CEOs. <laughs> you get the perspective and you go, something's wrong. And there are lots of things wrong. But as we look at leadership and that interaction between followers and factors, we've also got to look at things like opportunity. But the important thing is, as you mentioned in the book, when you do mention that statistic about more Johns, which obviously I found relatively annoying, that um, you mentioned that it's not, it's not about quotas, uh, that the reason we want to have more women leaders. It's right. because generally it's better for business, which I think you talk about. That's right. Yeah. Businesses form, perform better when they have greater diversity. I mean, it's just absolute fact. If you go down and look at the data, if they've got more diversity, they make more money. If they have better diversity in the board of directors, they make more money. You can't, I mean, you don't argue, I don't argue with data. Let's talk a little bit about personality. 
How important is it, and, and what did you find with your 13, that leaders have a, a compelling or a charism, a charisma? Because most of yours seem to. Um, how important is that, that they're someone that not only you want to emulate, but that they have a, a liveliness about them? I, that's an interesting point. Um, they were not all charismatic in the same way. If you take Maximilien Robespierre, who, of course, led the Committee of Public Safety in the French Revolution, he was not charismatic in the way we might consider it. He was actually a bit of an introvert, I was a, very much of an introvert. He spent most of his time in his apartments in Paris. He wrote speeches and he wrote letters and he sent them out. And most of them were delivered to people as opposed to speaking. In fact, he wasn't a gifted speaker. So if he had a speech and he gave it, it wasn't something that would impress you. But there was a kind of charisma that was, came from his zealotry. He had become infused with enthusiasm for Rousseau's writing and the virtuous society. And he believed that that's where France had to go. And when the French Revolution in 1789 began the process and then later uh, actually uh, executed the monarchy, there were people who had great second doubts. There were people who said, well, we shouldn't do that. We should go back to a constitutional monarchy. We, we should hit some middle ground. And Robespierre was the guy who said, no, this is the direction we're going. He was unwavering. He was so firm in his conviction. He burned white hot like a flame. And what that did was it gave people the chance to look at him and go, wait a minute, if he's got no doubts, there must be something to that. And he never wavered, and his zealotry just pulled people toward him. So it wasn't charisma in the traditional sense. It was charisma through this absolute conviction. Abu Musab al-Zarqawi, the, the terrorist leader of al-Qaeda in Iraq, who I ended up spending two and a half years fighting against, he had a strange sort of charisma. He wasn't well-educated, got thrown in prison in Jordan for five years, tried to cut off a tattoo to show everybody he was a pious Muslim. When he got out and he started to, to lead al-Qaeda in Iraq, he personally beheaded a young American named Mick Berg on video. Some of you would have seen it. It's the spring of 2004. It's pretty emotional for all of us at the time, and I vowed we'd kill him. But the reality is, if he'd sat in here, to some of us, he would have looked like a thug. To other people, he wore all black. He had the classic terrorist leader look. He wore all black. But in reality, he was so focused on the mission, so unwilling to compromise, so convinced that he and the movement was right, that he would go out and lead patiently, lead bravely, that in fact, he became the kind of leader that even Iraqis and other people who came to the fight, they didn't share the fervency of his belief but they were willing to follow him because here's a guy who is just so incredibly committed. So the answer is some of our leaders had just extraordinary charisma like Leonard Bernstein. You just wanted to be around Leonard Bernstein, but others you didn't want to be around, but you're captivated by. And so there is something to it. And talking about being captivated by, I mean, one of the things we often think of as a good leader needs to be a very good communicator, to be able to speak to an, an audience. Again, that seems to be a little bit of a, a myth. And what yeah. Martin Luther King's speech, for example, um, isn't exactly what we thought it was. Tell us a little bit about the importance yeah. of good communication. You know, communication in some way. Uh, Dr. Martin Luther King, in August of 1963, gave a speech that most of you probably heard about or seen clips of. It's the I Have a Dream speech that he gave on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. And it was given to 250,000 people who'd marched for the March for Jobs and Progress in D.C. He was the headline speaker. I think he was the 16th speaker of the afternoon. So he'd had this just array of speakers before him, people waiting around shift and weight from one leg to the other. But they wanted to hear Dr. King because he was the guy who was most well-known. He was the leader of the civil rights movement. He writes a speech until four in the morning. And this is a guy who writes incredible letters from a Birmingham jail. He writes speeches and, and uh, sermons. But he writes till four in the morning on this speech. And then he gets up to give it. In the first 11 minutes, he's not connecting with the audience. They're polite and they listen, but they're just not connecting. And then Mahalia Jackson, a noted gospel singer who knew Dr. King well, was near. And she goes, Martin, tell him about the dream. 
and he shifts from his prepared speech and he goes into a familiar riff. I've been to the mountaintop. I have a dream. And it captivates the audience and it captivates the nation. It captivates history. And so we tend to think of Dr. King in this moment where he gives this amazing speech and we say, wow, what a great guy. What a great speaker. But in reality, in 1963, he'd already been in the movement for eight years. He began in 1955, December 1955, as a 26-year-old pastor who had just arrived to Montgomery, Alabama. And they were trying to, to do a, an effort, a movement to desegregate public transportation buses. And so as the African-American population got together and said, how are we going to do this? They elected Martin Luther King, this 26-year-old newcomer, to be the leader of what they call the Montgomery Improvement Association. And for the next more than a year, he orchestrates this movement that includes African-Americans walking to work, carpooling to work, doing anything they can to avoid using public transportation. And after 382 days, they win. They desegregate public transportation. But that's not the end. Martin Luther King then becomes a leader that moves around the South, essentially leading a movement. But he's never elected. He's never appointed. He's not in charge. In fact, what he has to do is constantly pull together a constellation of different groups, all interested in civil rights, but different in their nature, and many with very strong-willed leaders who've been in civil rights longer than Dr. King. And it's a masterful leadership job that's management leadership constantly adapting to changing conditions. The speech in 63 precedes his murder five years later in 1968. And the amazing thing is after 13 years of leading this movement, managing it, leading it, rhetorically representing it, and he's killed suddenly at the Lorraine Motel in Memphis, Tennessee. You'd think that someone this central, it would cause the movement to collapse or stop and it doesn't. It keeps moving on, which may be the biggest tribute to what he actually created, and that was a movement that had its own momentum and its own belief in itself. That is perhaps the unifying factor. What, what, what draws all 13 together? Because obviously they're very, very complex, but what yeah. did you find, and I think you just alluded to it there, one thing that unified all those leaders? Yeah, there's really not, except that they emerged as leaders. You know, we looked to see, was there going to be a trait? Was there going to be some kind of burning intent on their part, this ambition or something? And you can't find it. That's one of the, uh, the fascinating part of the study. What we found is some of them emerged as leaders unintentionally. Albert Einstein's a physicist. He's a brilliant guy. We can't understand what he did. We, we can say E equals MC squared, but we don't know what it means. I'm right, aren't I? Yeah. And, and yet, he becomes a leader because in 1923, he's the most famous man in the world. And he's just a young physicist. He was a patent clerk in 1905 when he wrote the amazing papers that revolutionized physics, to including the special theory of relativity. He's not very old when he comes out with the general theory of relativity. And really, that's about the last big thing he ever does in physics. But what he does do is he communicates constantly through the community of people in physics, scientists, people who support it. He becomes a symbol. He writes 30,000 letters during his lifetime connecting people, propagating, helping other younger physicists. He's offered the presidency of Israel. And he turns it down. He says, I'm not qualified for that. But he, but that time he'd become a symbol for people. He looked like everybody's uncle, you know, rumpled clothes, hair, big mustache. But in reality, he'd become more of a symbol than he was any kind of practical leader. So he emerged as a leader without ever appearing to have sought it. But he did understand it. Do you think anyone um, is born a leader, a natural born leader? Yeah, that's a question we ask ourselves a lot. I think many people are born with traits that help them be leaders. They might be very intelligent. They might be naturally charismatic. They might be strong or whatever it is for the society that they're in, which I think are tools which help. I think leadership, I personally believe leadership is learned. I think it starts very early with the examples you're around, usually your parents, 
maybe teachers, and then it, it grows up from there. And most leaders develop some sense of responsibility that something has to happen. Many of you who've been in combat know that informal leaders arise when somebody's in a situation and something has to happen and it's not happening. And then suddenly corporal so-and-so or private so-and-so suddenly shows this amazing amount of leadership and you go, wow, where did that come from? And it came from somewhere in his life. He's seen that, he's known that. I don't think it sits inside you dormant. I think it's a learned thing, mostly through experience. Let's talk a little bit about the leader of the United States. Um, what kind of a leader is Donald Trump? Um, I mean, he is, he, he, is a, he has been a successful in his own way yeah. leader and also part of a movement that we're seeing Absolutely. across the world. You know, if somebody tells me that uh, President Trump is a bad leader, I would, I would contest that. If they told me he was an ineffective leader, ineffective leader, I'd contest that as well. He's clearly been remarkably effective. Here's a business guy who got elected president. And with the midterm elections, he didn't lose as badly as most parties do in the midterm elections when they're in power. So in reality, he's been very effective. Now, I separate good and bad from effective or not because good and bad sort of got a, a value judgment to it. But he's been very effective, and he's been largely successful in many things he wanted to do or wants to do. Now, I would argue... I don't think he's a good leader for America. I think that what he has done is he's pulled at emotions that are inside each of us. He stimulated things that aren't the best of us. He has caused us, there's more division than before, but also he's caused emotions and things like against immigrants and whatnot that I think are ultimately counter to what I believe the American character is. I think his inability to stick to the truth is different from what we would demand from our children. I think some of his other conduct is not the kind of example or representation that we want for the people we work with or the people that represent us. So I think from that standpoint, he's been a very negative leader for the United States. But he's where he is now. And what will be interesting to see is at what point the people of the United States start to look at the mirror, look themselves in the mirror and say, what do I believe in? What are my values? What do I want the values of my nation to be? And when they do that and we decide then, who do we need for our leaders? What kind of leaders do we really want to have? Then I think many of the things that President Trump has done will, will prove to be disconnected from the real aspirations of the American people. That's what I want to believe, and that's what I do. How do you think that the results of the midterms will affect the power that he now has for the next few years? Yeah, I, I don't think the, the actual results of the Democrats taking the House and the Senate taking the Senate means much. I could make an argument from a strict political sense. It's good for him to lose the House because now when things don't happen, he can blame it on that. He can say, look, I could have done it, because a lot of what he does is coulda, woulda, shoulda. Um, and so I actually think for the presidential election, it's an advantage for him. What we really need to look at, though, is this midterm election, usually Americans don't vote in high numbers in the midterm. In 2014, 83 million people came out to vote. Yesterday, 114 million people came out to vote. That's hugely different. And what happened is with that kind of engagement, that means America is listening. That means America is paying attention. And what I think portends is two years from now, I would imagine the number of voters will go up even more. That's good because Americans need to be engaged. In fact, it, you know, if I had a suggestion for the nation, it would be mandatory voting. You could go in the booth and vote for nobody, but everybody has to vote. And the reason I'd be for that is it would do away with all voter suppression. It would take away the ability to stop certain people from voting by making it hard. And we've got a bad history of that. And so I think that's the real story. People aren't going to talk about it much in the near term, but this increased engagement in politics is going to change all the dynamics. The other thing that changed yesterday 
was the increase in the number of females that were elected. That's going to change things too. You know, when you have a very small number of any group, like females, they become maybe a vocal and important minority. When they get above a certain number, then suddenly the dynamic changes. There's a critical mass to it. Maybe we're getting close to that. Plus, we got a lot of new energy in many of the people who are uh, elected. So that could help to change the dynamic as well. Will the change dynamic have any effect on foreign policy? Or is that the one area that they cannot uh, influence him going forward? Yeah. Um, foreign policy is traditionally in America supposed to be not much affected by the party in power. It's supposed to be more consistent than domestic policy because our allies and our long-term relationships matter so much. That's changed in the last few years, obviously. Uh, President Obama actually took it in a pretty different direction than President Bush had. President Trump has put his own stamp on foreign policy. I don't think the Congress will change foreign policy very much. Um, they can opine about it, but I don't think they've got the, the wherewithal to do that. But I think the world will help change that. The increased number of voter, the increased voter engagement in the U.S., as people start to speak up and say, we're not happy the way we are being portrayed in the world. We're not happy, perhaps, the way we are uh, conducting ourselves in the world. There are a lot of things that President Trump has done in foreign policy I don't have any dispute with. There are things that had to happen and have happened, but the tone is often damaging. And so I think it's very important that we relook that, and I'm hopeful that that's going to happen. Um, Afghanistan is one of the, obviously, you, you served there. Um, there's been talk of withdrawing forces for many years. Do you think the time has come now to withdraw from Afghanistan? Yeah, I'm, I'm just amazingly, I'm not the right person to ask that question because I'm biased. I really like the Afghan people. I really care about that country. And so I, I admit to you up front, you know, any answer I give you is colored by that. I can't make one of these dispassionate decisions because people say, well, they're corrupt. They fight. The Taliban does this. I've been over there and I've seen the young girls we put in school. I've been over there and I've seen soldiers who lost. I once went to the hospital and an Afghan soldier had lost both legs above the knee and one arm. And I go in to visit him with President Karzai. And the guy goes, all I would like to do is continue to serve my country. Now, this is a kid who comes from nothing, gets badly wounded, and he does not have the same medical care that your wounded here or our wounded in the States get. And yet, this is what he says. Was it genuine? It seemed genuine to me. And so, if you step from afar and you see Afghanistan, you see the graveyard of empires, you see the quagmire, you see all these things you don't like, when you get up close, it doesn't look like that. It looks like people. It looks like possibilities. And so, what I'd say is, I don't know what we will do. I do know that any decision maker as a national leader has a hugely difficult problem because it's easy to sit there and say, Afghanistan, 17 years, it's hard, we should get out. But if we were to pull out and the Taliban were establish a regime over most of Afghanistan again, and if they brought al-Qaeda back in where the 9-11 attacks were launched from, that would be so politically difficult for an American president that it has put most of them in this really difficult uh, conundrum. So I don't have a clever answer for Afghanistan. I wish I did. You, you talk about your own time there. In general, what lessons about leadership did you learn from your own experiences yeah. as a general? Um, I was there starting in 2002, part of every year up to 2009, because Joint Special Operations Command was operating there. I spent more time in Iraq, much more, but I, I would do uh, a lot of time in Afghanistan as well. I actually took over in the summer of 2009, and that's different when you take over and you're there full time. That's a different perspective, and so I'll address my answer to that period. I took over at a period when the war was eight years old and everybody had lost interest in it. All our allies in the coalition wanted out to include the United States. Our Afghan partners had lost confidence that we were gonna be the solution to their problem. The Pakistanis thought we were gonna leave so they were in that constant thing where they're for us and against us at the same time. But they were already calculating that we were going to leave and we, or we were going to fail. And so had the Taliban. And so 
the challenge we had to do starting in the summer of 2009, if the mission wasn't going to change, that was the first question I asked my leadership. They said, no, the mission's the same. Went to Brussels, talked to the NATO Secretary General, said, nope, the mission's changed. We're still trying to get stability in Afghanistan, so that's what we want you to work toward. Then the question came is, how do you change that? And the first thing you had to do was change the sense of the lack of confidence. You had to convince people that we could win this, we should win this, and we would win this, which meant we had to be morally the right force that they believed in. We had to be capability-wise, the force that could do it, doing the right things. And then we had to show the will that we would win. We had to convince people we'd stay. And that's really hard. Did you have to believe in it yourself? To convince others. That's the fascinating paradox of it. Um, because when I was sent over, I was asked to do an assessment. And I did, and I went back and told my leadership, if we want to have any chance to win, we have to change our strategy. We have to start protecting the population, and we're going to need to do a number of things. If you're not willing to do that, don't do anything else. Just let's give it up now. If you are willing to do that, and you're willing to put the resources in to do it, we have a 50-50 chance at best of succeeding. That's it, 50-50 at best. But if that's what you want to do, that's what we'll do. And the decision came back, yeah. It was kind of a tepid support, but it was, yeah, we put in the additional forces, change the strategy, and we would do that. So as you do that, then the leader in charge. In the United States, when you are confirmed for three- or four-star general, you have to sign a piece of paper from the Senate that says, if I'm asked my opinion... I will give my real opinion. I won't just say what it is the administration tells me to say. That's a tough one because you're told what, to, you're told what the decision is in any case, what the, the administration course of action is, and then you're called in to testify to the Senate and Congress, and you're asked questions. So what do you think? And that's the paradox. You're in this tough situation. People see a general and they say, okay, did I believe in Afghanistan or any general in a case like this? If I go in front of the, the Senate or in front of press and they say, Afghanistan's really hard. You're the 10th commander in ISAF in eight years. We are, we are not making progress. Do you think we can win? And I go, it's dodgy. I don't know. <laughs> they'd say, well, the people who agreed, they'd go, that's honest. But I had 150,000 troops in Afghanistan who would have gone, WTF. <laughs> We're out here being told to risk our life, and you're telling us. <sighs> so you can't. When Henry V at Agincourt, in Shakespeare's telling, gives the amazing speech, do you think he was sure they could beat the French? The answer was, I'm sure he wasn't. But I think he knew that if they didn't show confidence, if he didn't show enthusiasm, if he didn't show conviction, it was sure that they couldn't and they wouldn't. And so the general is in a position, or any military leader, of you have got to have that confidence or you guarantee failure. And it borders on sometimes you show confidence when you're not confident. You tendered your resignation um, in 2010. Would you do anything differently um, if you could go back? Why did you decide to, to do that? Well, what do you think, Anna? <laughs> I don't know. You say it's important to speak your mind. Yeah. I mean, here I get burned touching the hot stove. Yeah, I would do a lot different. Um, there were a number of things I'd do different in command, um, not in intent or whatever, but there were mistakes I made and things I didn't do in dealing with political leadership that I could have done a lot better, and I'm perfectly willing to tell you that. When the Rolling Stone article, which you're really getting at, the thing that caused me to submit my uh, resignation, it was a freelance guy writing for the uh, Rolling Stone that came and embedded with us just for short periods, not for a long period. And he wrote this article, and it was supposed to be a puff piece about the command team saying, yeah, just great guys. They've been at war together for a long time. And then it came out about 2 in the morning, and it's titled Runaway General." I'm going, this can't be good. <laughs> and what he does is he portrays this kind of this locker room group of people who out of control and whatnot. And I don't think it was fair, you know, and, and I'm, but, but I'm probably going to think that, right? 
But I don't think it was fair. But it didn't matter because now we have this contentious article that gets put on the desk of the president of the United States, who's my boss. And my job is not to put contentious things on his desk. And I'm responsible. Whether it's right or not, I'm responsible. And so I'm asked to fly back to the Washington. That next day I do that. I go into the president, offer my resignation. And I said, he asked me, what happened? What's the background? I said, I don't know. It's only been 24 hours. I don't know what happened and didn't. I know that doesn't represent the team I know. But it doesn't matter. They're my team and I'm responsible. If they did or didn't do it, I'm responsible for the story. So here's my resignation. If you want to accept it, I've got no problem with that. If you want to tell me to go back to Afghanistan and keep coloring, I'm fine with that too. And he accepted my resignation, and, and we had a cordial meeting, and I still have good relations with him. Now, do I regret the incident more than anything else in my life? Do I regret that it happened? Sure, I do. That moment, I lost a career that I'd been at for 38 years. In an instant, everything I thought I was is gone. Now I can't even, when people ask me who I was from age 17 on, I say, I'm a soldier. In an instant, when they ask me that question, I don't know what to say. I'm suddenly notorious. I'm on the newspaper and TV and the ticker at the bottom every two or three minutes. Disgraced general, fired general. Some people I knew went on TV and opined how I needed to be fired. And they didn't know anything about what had happened or not happened. But you watch some of that and you go, Phew. but the point is, I'm responsible. Can't cry over it. I signed up for it. When things happened well, I took credit for them. Didn't complain about that. So when things don't go well, I'm responsible. And then the other thing that, that helped most is, when you're at a moment like that, and I predict every one of this room will fail at some time in your life. You may not fail on the front page of the paper like I did. You may not fail publicly at all, but you'll have something that you think you didn't get right and it didn't come out as you wanted it to. And you really got two choices. One choice is to spend the rest of your life relitigating it. There is a duty description for retired general officers called, you know, disgraced angry, retired general. And that's it. You can actually spend the rest of your time being that. And I just said, I'm not, not interested. I'm going to live life forward. I can't change anything in the past, so I worry about it. I'm going to just do things forward. And every day after that, what I've tried to do is live my life in a way that sort of disproves what anybody read. They meet me, they hang out with me or whatever. They go, boy, that doesn't seem like the same thing portrayed there. That's the best I can do. And if people don't reach that conclusion, I can live with that. But, but I have to do that because a lot of people who believed in me before that had placed their faith. Many had come to war with me and for me because I asked them to. I had to keep that faith with them. And it's turned out to be really good for me because life goes forward. I've been incredibly fortunate ever since I left the service. So except for like one bad day, my life's been, the, I mean, it was a really bad day. Um, <laughs> life's been just extraordinary. Well, it's, it's our fortune, um, of course, in a way. It was, you've written this book and you're able to come and talk to us this evening. I, I want to hand over to you in, in one moment, but I, I said at the beginning that you couldn't take a 10-point plan from your book about, about what, to be a lead, what it is to be a leader or what we should take away, but you do offer at the end some sort of practical implications for people. I'm sure there are people in the audience who think of themselves, who are leaders in work. What would you say that the lessons or, or your advice to them is in a nutshell? Yeah, in a, in a nutshell is um, you are going to go forward and try to lead. And I use the example of Ted Williams, an American baseball player. In 1941, he batted 406. Highest average at that point anyone had ever gotten. It was extraordinary. 406 is a percentage, 0.406. It meant he got out. He didn't get a hit 60% of the time. He failed 60% of the time he went to bat. And that's the way it works in leadership. You are going to fail as much as you succeed. And the reality is you can't control that. There are a lot of things that happen that are beyond. You can do everything right and still fail. But the thing you can focus on is what you are trying to do. 
what you were genuinely trying to do. And if that's the way you're judged, I'm good with that. The last thing is you talk about um, the idea that we might be, or people talk about the idea that we might be in a post-leadership age or the age of the follower. Yeah. Um, do we need leaders? Uh, we do. I, I think we are not in a follower age. I think we're in a team age. I think we're in an age where the idea of the single leader who directs people to do things, who's on the pedestal and whatnot, isn't practical anymore. Things are too fast. Things are too complex. We may still need inspiration from Justin Bieber and people like that. Um, <laughs> they'll be important. But really, when we're doing complex tasks, we're going to do them with teams. And we're going to, therefore, decentralize the leadership around what the military would call mission command. And that's going to be really important. So leadership will be more diffuse, and it won't be embodied in a single person nearly as much as it has been in the past. Um, I will now hand over to you. Um, can you raise your hand? There's roving mics here. So try and keep your um, questions quite brief and questions, if possible, so that we can get through as many uh, as we can. Thank you. This gentleman here. Thank you, General. Um, I advise young people who run companies, and you in imply that uh, leadership is something that can be learned. Can you suggest what would be a good place to uh, recommend the people I work with to go and learn, given that they can't take four years out and go to West Point and the equivalent in the UK? Yeah, talk about a softball. My company runs the Crystal Group Leadership Institute, so no. Um, <laughs> All the others are crap. Ours is really, yeah. <laughs> no, I think there are two things you can do. You can teach people a lot of skills as a leader, and you can give them background on values. You can do those things, and they're very helpful. Uh, but I also think you need to try to create situations and experiences for them. And most of this is experiential, where they're in entirely new environments, where they've got to learn to sense what the conditions are, what the followers or the other participants are and adjust themselves in their leadership style to that. One of the problems of military leadership is if, if the organization's too disciplined at all, you're like pieces that move and bricks that move into expected things, and you actually grow less. So if I was creating leaders for the future, I'd be trying to put them in those different environments with tasks that they're unfamiliar with, and they've got to learn to deal with different kinds of people and constantly changing requirements. I think that builds their confidence and their competence. Thanks. Yeah. Is there anything you do differently now as a result of lessons you learned writing this book? I think the, uh, the biggest thing is I continue to move on this journey of my, my understanding of leadership toward the idea that it is this complex thing you can't master. It is the understanding that what I've really got to do is be extraordinarily humble about that. I've got to approach every task with the idea that on my best day, I can't master it. But I can share with the people around me and create, again, the team effect to do that. So that's the biggest change for me. And that's a lot because at age 64, you stop changing. You know, you're, you're pretty set in your ways. Thank you. Yeah, this lady there. Good evening, sir. Yeah. Um, I was wondering, what do you, characteristics do you think a woman would need to have in order to actually be president of the United States? Yeah. The, the problem is not with the woman. The problem is with the electorate. Um, it's in the near term, and I'm going to be completely honest, in the near term, there's this funny thing people want, like Margaret Thatcher ran into, people want a female politician to perform like a man in many ways, but if she performs too much like a man, they say, no, you're trying to be a man. And so it's damned if you do, damned if you don't. Um, I think it's just going to take in the United States sort of this proven competence over time. Secretary Clinton got pretty close. She was proven competent as a senator, proven competent as a secretary of state. She just had other baggage that was unique to her, not as a woman, but unique to her as being, you know, connected to Bill Clinton and, and her story. So we're not far from it, I don't think. I, I think there's a little bit of resistance to it now that will wear down in the next few years. But uh, they're just going to have to be really competent professional pros 
And, and that's maybe unfair because some men don't have to be that. Um, I'm not sure. Oh, there is a mic up there. Brilliant. <clears throat> Hi. Um, with, I'm up here. I'm sorry. Up Just top. up there. <laughs> with, uh, How'd you get up there? <laughs> it's good, thanks. Uh, with sport being such a big part of society, did um, you consider putting any sporting leaders in there? And if so, who was close to the cut? It's funny because I'm smiling at my co-author, Jay. We did. We were very interested in putting sports leaders in there. We, we thought at one point about using players, like we thought about a Babe Ruth because they became a hero to, to American uh, children and whatnot, a big iconic figure. We looked at coaches. We looked at Bill Belichick, but he was alive. That was a problem. Um, <laughs> we, we could have adjusted that, but uh, <laughs> we, looked at, we looked at Vince Lombardi. And the thing that was interesting about Vince Lombardi and in uh, football coaching is he coached at the high school, college, and pro level, and he changed how he coached at each level. He adapted. When he had very disciplined cadets at West Point, when he was an assistant coach there, he was one way. When he coached the Green Bay Packers and he had Paul Horning, there's a running back who drank a case of beer a night, he led differently. And, but I think sports leaders are, are great uh, examples of that. And we just ran out of space to do it. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, General. Um, you mentioned about uh, confidence and leaders almost having to be able to show that confidence to give their followers that sense of, yes, things are okay. But had you ever encountered leaders who had had to move from a place where they really were never as good at showing confidence? And if so, sort of how did they manage to make that transition? Yeah. Um, you know, most of us, as you rise in positions, one, you get more experience, so you show more confidence, but you actually have less confidence because you are less competent in your job. The meeting of general officer, which a lot of people don't know, it means you no longer are an infantry officer, a cavalry officer, or something. You're general, meaning you're you cover a wide. Sure, you're a mile wide and an inch deep. By the time you become a four-star, you don't know that much about what's happening down in the force, particularly new equipment changes, tactics. I mean, you pretend you do, but you don't. <laughs> and so you're confident in one way, but you're not confident in the other way because you're just not close to it where, you know, you can take apart the, the weapon and, and do that kind of thing. Yet we have this need to show confidence. So we, sometimes that's a big mistake. We, we put this veneer around us that acts like we know all, act like we're never scared, never worried, never confused. Part of that's important. I don't want to be in a firefight, look over and see my commander sobbing quietly. It's worrisome. But at the same time, if my commander doesn't know the answer to the question, I want him to say that. I don't want him to BS anybody. And I think at senior levels, we need, and with all leaders, we need a little more curiosity in that, say, asking questions of what our force knows or what our team knows, being able to say, I don't know, being able to admit that. And if you've got concerns about something, I'm not, again, I'm not saying don't show a lot of fear or things, but be willing to show some reality to you. Again, I'm, I waver on the vulnerability thing. You, you do want people to show a certain amount of vulnerability, but you don't want to, we don't want people to lose confidence because you seem like you're, you're incompetent and no confidence and everything else. So, so there's a balance there, but it's honesty that really, that works most. Uh, if you got that question, say it. Yeah, that's okay. Lots of questions. Um, it's to, can we get, come into the middle? Yeah, this gentleman here. Should Einstein have become leader of Israel? I'm sorry? Should Einstein have become leader of Israel? No, he had no clue. <laughs> uh, and you know what was admirable? That's what he told them. He said, I have no clue. What, how would I help? And they were terrified at first he might accept it <laughs> because they knew he had no clue. Uh, yeah. Yes. Hello, General. Sure. Uh, quick question. Where, where's your stance on don't ask, don't tell? And should women be allowed to serve on the front lines? Yeah, I'll talk to the second one first. 
You know, we had this big hand-wringing in the United States about should women be allowed to serve in combat. The problem is we had the argument about 10 years after they were already in combat. I mean, women are shooting and doing all this stuff and getting shot. And I remember being over there and most people in the force are going, whoa, it's, it's over because there were no lines in Afghanistan and Iraq. And so they were there. And so to me, the discussion was already had on the ground. I do think it was good that we finally formalized it and sort of told the people who hadn't gotten a word. But the answer is yes. Um, now, that opens up a lot of things. If we ever go back to a draft, we need to draft women just like we draft men. So where you give opportunity must be matched with responsibility. But I don't think that that would be a, a big issue. Don't ask, don't tell. If, if you all aren't familiar with it, it was a compromise solution to the question of gays in the military that was implemented about 20 years ago. And what happened was we had a policy that said that if you were gay and people knew about it, you could be chaptered, forced out of the army. Pretty disgraced when I was a young officer. If someone was found to be uh, homosexual, they were bounced out and it was embarrassing and it was just really not well done. Then they came to the realization that, one, there were a lot of gays serving effectively and loyally in the army. And they came up with this compromise thing called don't ask, don't tell. And that meant that Someone could be gay in the service. You couldn't ask them if they were gay. But if they told you they were gay without being uh, asked, you threw them out of the army because we don't want gays. And you go, well, wait a minute. That is, that's almost hypocritical. And it wasn't intentionally hypocritical. It was a compromise that they tried to do because there were just so many conflicting feelings about it. What happened in, in gays in the military was very similar to what happened with uh, women in combat. Sort of time passed. There was a bunch of people that said, no, 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 no. We just can't do that. The morale of the force will go down. But then almost everybody knew someone in the military was gay and was serving very well. And they said, we don't want gays in the military, but Bob's really good and I need him. <laughs> and, and so I think it, you know, once you're in that situation, you go, what are we talking about? Let's decide if somebody was an effective soldier or not. Let's not care about that. But we had that awkward policy. And, and the sad part of it, it put a lot of people in the position of having to be dishonest, having essentially to deny something, and commanders to know something and not... It was just weird. And so it was a mistake that I'm glad it's been corrected. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this lady here in the yellow... You talk about the future of leadership being decentralized. I'm just wondering, is anyone in your book, has, have they uh, shown behaviors, good behaviors towards decentralized leadership, or have you thought about how leaders need to change the way they behave in order to achieve that? Yeah, that's great. We never thought about that as one of the themes to look at in our leaders, and my, my head's going really fast um, to see if I can think of one that was particularly like that. I, I, I don't, none of them jump out at me. What I would say is, as we do it in the future, what leaders are going to have to do is understand that things at the edge of the organization happen too fast to centrally control them. If you think of the industrial model really came into play in the 19th century, where you're doing big, complicated things together, moving an army, building uh, big projects or, or complicated machinery with assembly lines. We had centralized control. A few smart people figured out this extraordinary system, and then they broke down the tasks into discrete tasks. They linked them all together, and really the only people who understood that were a few people who managed it. That worked fine when you're trying to get efficiency on something over time, but it doesn't change often. The problem is when things change quickly like a military plan from the First World War. They'd put together these plans, and they weren't stupid. They actually were very complicated plans, well thought through. But as soon as they get into contact and reality changes the conditions, then everything's got to change. And yet if you've got this big centralized thing that says the artillery's going to fire at this amount of time, and that's not ground truth anymore, things go badly. So what we've got to do now is because that's truth. Now, that's just reality and everything all the time now. We've got to have a situation where information doesn't go to the top for 
people at the senior point to make the decision and give direction. It's got to go to everybody. And it's got to go to everybody along with intent or mission command that then people make decisions within that. Now, fortunately, as things got complex, they got faster, information technology came. It's part of the problem, but it's part of the solution as well. You can now pass that information down to people so that they can make those decisions. The, the contradiction or challenge there is really good information technology tempts you into micromanagement because you suddenly can see everything. You can talk to everybody, so shit, what I, why shouldn't I manage it? You shouldn't because you can't. I mean, it's just too fast, too complex. Instead, you've got to leverage the information technology actually to decentralize. We've probably got time for one more. Yes, this gentleman in the middle. It's better be um, great if you're the last question. <laughs> Can I pick up that last point you were making? Because when Plutarch was writing his stuff, there wasn't the pressure of emails. How did you separate yourself from this tide of information and what were the disciplines that you imposed upon yourself to stand back and and actually to sort of lead rather than to manage yeah that's a really good question because i don't think i ever did master it you know in the in the period the, the most intense period when i was in joint special operations command i was there for five years and i stayed there the whole time and that was the period when i slept four hours a night ate one meal a day and so what i did was create more time to help a little bit um, that's not the right answer because most do it and you can't do it forever. Um, we did a few things. One, at first we had suggestions that we would limit emails, only send certain emails to certain people. We decided who knows who needs to know something. So instead what we do is we share everything. We let people self-curate their own stuff and decide what they do. That worked better. On our website, we used a SharePoint portal site. We put things in four levels and the first level, level one, was push information. Everyone in the command needed to know it. The analogy we use, front page above the fold. Like if you walked by a newspaper or a newsstand and you look at the front page, you see everything that's happening and you know if you need to buy a paper, open it up and, and get more detail on something. If you don't, all right. We did that and we pushed that to the whole command. You couldn't dodge it. Then there were three levels below that. All were pull, where you, depending upon what you needed and where you went. That's the best we came to. Um, we never were able to master exactly how to control email, how to control uh, calls and things like that. We did find that we stopped having one-on-one -on -one meetings unless it was a personal issue. We brought bigger groups in because what you didn't want to have is a one-on-one -on -one meeting where this person has to go tell their subordinates who's got it. We just started telling everybody all at the same time. It was a pretty big culture shift that people had to get used to, but it was so much more efficient that I think those are the things we, we move towards. Thank you. Um, Sir, oh. Sorry, oh. I'll ask the last question. Can I please ask, what was the mission statement in Afghanistan? Yours. Yeah. It's funny, we had a really contentious uh, video teleconference with the uh, White House one night, and our mission statement was to try to uh, protect the stability of Afghanistan, the existence, the sovereignty and stability of the Afghan state in order to prevent it from becoming a terrorist safe haven again for Al Qaeda. Now, implied in that, if you're going to create the sovereignty or protect the sovereignty and stability of the country, you're also going to leave a, a functioning country. But the, the, the in order to was to prevent Al Qaeda from reoccupying and having a base that they can work from. I don't think people understood it very well. I, I don't think everybody did. And I don't, think, I don't think we had enough really hard discussions about it because it implies a certain level of action. It resides a certain level of resources. And sometimes the imprecision of language or the unwillingness for people to jump in and put their arms around it was, was less than it needed to be. I'm very sorry um, if we haven't managed to get to you with your question, but thank you all very much for coming, and th thank you again, General McChrystal. It's been a fascinating. Okay.